unreclaimed urban space for the Morris, which was a museum which was established in one of the historic squats here on the Lower East Side um, a few months ago. This is C Squat, for those of you who don't know, one of the original abandoned buildings which was reclaimed and taken over as a, um, as a squat way back in the 1980s and continues to be uh, an example of reclaimed urban space today. So at the museum, when we talk about reclaimed urban space, we're primarily talking about squats. We're talking about community gardens, like the beautiful one across the street, which was established way back in 1977. Um, and uh, basically taking, uh, taking land and property, which has been disused by the capitalist system, and reclaiming it for the people in the spirit of creating a new society in the vacant lots of the old. Um, and I do, uh, I do tours, I do walking tours every Sunday at 3 o'clock of, uh, of the gardens and the squats in the neighborhood um, starting from here, starting from, from the Morris on Sunday at 3. And it's very interesting, if you've been following what's in the news lately, the absolutely amazing events and uprisings going on all around the world, a lot of them have got to do with exactly this issue of, uh, of reclaimed geographic space, and particularly urban space. Um, people are aware of uh, the uprising which is going on in Istanbul, Turkey at the moment, began with uh, the city's plans to, to destroy one of the, uh, the last green spaces, one of the last public parks in downtown Istanbul, and turned it into a shopping mall. And that's what set off what has now become a nationwide uprising in Turkey. Similarly, uh, one of the key issues behind uh, the uprising, which is currently going on in Brazil, is uh, uh, the government is planning on uh, clearing out a lot of the favelas, or these sort of informal squatter communities or shanty towns in the, uh, in, in the north of Rio de Janeiro and also other cities in the country, in order to build new sports stadiums for the, uh, for the World Cup, which is, which is scheduled to be there. So uh, these are, uh, you know, it's very interesting that there's sort of a, uh, a convergence happening on the global stage between uh, issues of basic class justice and uh, issues of uh, urban ecology and control of space. So for the past several years now, I've been, I've been struggling to finish a manuscript about indigenous struggles in, um, in the Andean nations of South America. Um, and these are photos which uh, some of them I took and uh, some of them were taken by uh, my good friend Eric Claudio in Peru, Eric C. Estas Mirando uh, in the internet, for YouTube in Lima. Muchísimas gracias por su ayuda con los fotos. Um, and we're going to start off looking at, uh, looking at Lima, then we're going to go into some of the uh, indigenous struggles for control of land in the, uh, in the Sierras and in the Selva and the, in the mountains and, and in the jungles of Peru. This is uh, the Cono Norte of Lima. And as in Rio de Janeiro, the, uh, the poor areas are in the north of town, the north of the city, the Congo Norte. And uh, as you can see, it's a big, super developed city. Whoops. Here we go. And uh, there's a lot of protests, which are almost always going on. The current president, Oyanto Umala, was um, elected, I believe, two years ago as a sort of a left-wing populist, and uh, he ran uh, on a program of uh, standing up to the big corporations and the, and the mineral companies in particular, which are rapidly colonizing uh, the, the mountains of Peru and the, uh, the oil companies which are colonizing the rainforest, and uh, he was uh, viciously baited as a pawn of Hugo Chavez and all of this, and as soon as he got into power, he flipped completely, and he's been uh, giving a very, very free hand to the corporations since he's been in power. He's trying to privatize the uh, municipal water supply in Lima. So these are the uh, municipal water workers who are holding a, um, a protest against the uh, privatization of uh, the Lima's equivalent of the Department of Environmental Protection here in New York City. Uh, There's a big informal economy. A lot of people just um, doing the best they can, selling fruit on stands out in the street. A lot of uh, very creative use of, um, of work bicycles, work tricycles. Making churros. You know what churros are. They sell them on the subways here. It's sort of uh, long skinny donut type things. 
homeless guy living in his work tricycle. And this is what this is what squats look like in Lima, very similar to the uh, to the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, not quite on the same scale. But uh, there's a particularly in this area called La Independencia in the corner of Norte. But ever since uh, the 1980s, there's been a uh, sort of spontaneous colonization of the vacant land up in the, up in the mountains overlooking, overlooking the city. People just uh, moving in from the countryside because they didn't have land. There was a big exodus from the countryside in the, in the 1980s because of two, two sort of related phenomena. One, which was uh, that there had been an agrarian reform program in Peru in the 1960s, 1970s, where a lot of land was uh, redistributed to the peasants. And in the 1980s, when more conservative governments were in power, that started to turn around. The agrarian reform ended, and a lot of uh, a lot of the land started winding up back in the hands of uh, the oligarchs and the mineral companies and so on. So a lot of peasants were being pushed from the land. And then, because a lot of peasants were being pushed from the land, there was a lot of anger. You had the emergence of the Shining Path guerrilla movement, and there was a lot of conflict, human rights abuses, and so on. So there was a big exodus from the uh, from the countryside in those years, and people began to um, sort of come into Lima. And the population of Lima just exploded, and uh, people uh, just started uh, establishing uh, informal informal barrios, they call them shanty towns um, in uh, these areas of Lima. And uh, some of them, it's been a similar, it's very interesting. The same thing, sort of thing, was happening here in the Lower East Side in those same years, in the 1980s. Buildings like this one were taken over. And then eventually, there was some recognition of their squatter rights and deals were worked out, and some of them won the right to sit or the right to stay. And the same thing has been happening, the same sort of, um, same sort of process, same sort of struggle has been working its way out in, um, amongst the uh, campesinos who came in from the countryside and have been just sort of establishing informal settlements around Lima. And, uh, a lot of them, uh, when they arrived from the countryside, they continued to uh, to engage in in agriculture and started establishing um, what they call chakras. Chakras just means a um, a plot of land where you grow corn and beans, fruit, whatever you want to grow. And uh, they would come to the city and establish chakras or bamas on whatever land was available. But then, as Lima started to grow. The Chakra Savana started being taken over by landlords. Some of the ones which survived were incorporated into, into public parks, like this one. So we've actually got banana trees growing in, in this park. And uh, these little gardens which are lining, lining the sidewalks here are like surviving remnants of these Chakra Savanas, which were established probably in the 1980s or the 1990s. Again, banana trees. If you had been uh, at the same spot maybe 20 years ago, it would have actually been it would have actually been urban agriculture going on, and there still is to a certain extent. Banana trees in the middle of the city. And uh, well, let's see. This is a. Uh, Moving into the, the mural section of the, um, I'm sorry. Moving into the, the, the mural section of the presentation, there is actually a uh, a sort of um, progressive mayor in Lima right now by the name of the Iran, who um, has been doing a lot of very forward-thinking things, and among them was a program of uh, of encouraging um, encouraging murals on. Uh, on Walls around Lima, sort of a, an urban art initiative, and uh, uh, this probably predates the program. This is the uh, the Lima Gay Community Center, just like the one that we have on 13th Street, and uh, this is a representation of Tupac Amaru in drag. <laughs> Tup Tupac Amaru, of course, was an 18th century uh, uh, indigenous leader who led an uprising against um, against Spanish rule in the Cusco area, and then here he is uh, represented in. As a drag queen. This is probably just informal graffiti, kind of like uh, New York City in the 1970s. Here, this is uh, one of the more uh, official murals. 
This is in a, uh, in a park right in downtown Lima. You can see it's sort of on a, uh, on a feminist theme, celebrating women and their freedom and dignity. And there's a top here. Representation of a traditional indigenous ceremonial dance in downtown Lima. Another mural on a sort of feminist theme, eco-feminist, you would say. This is a singer, Miriam. Who's the name of the singer? What, what, what can you tell us about her? That's also supposed to be Tsukakamaru. Traditional indigenous woman. Do you know who the poet is? Diego Pulachet? Condor. Yeah, like we left. So this is uh, representing unity between the indigenous peoples of the Andes, represented by the Condor, and Mesoamerica, represented by the Eagle. And the name, Yakta, means town in Quechua. Right. Aztlan must be... Aztlan must be, yeah. exactly, the traditional birthplace of the, the Aztec people. Yeah. Yes. So it's a, sort of a portmanteau of the two names, Andean and Mexican. Now this is uh, this is Kilka, which is the uh, sort of the alternative or Bohemian district in Lima. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, you know here in New York City we kind of think of the such pressure from the real estate industry that the uh, an alternative enclave. First of all, they're always moving around because of uh, they, they get they get absorbed as it were by the real estate industry. And they're always kind of uh, off the beaten track a little bit. Like the Lower East Side was, I guess, 20 years kind of an alternative enclave. Then it jumped the river to Williamsburg, and now Williamsburg is being taken over by the real estate industry. And now, like Bushwick is where it's at, I guess. But uh, because, uh, you know, partially because uh, in the 1980s, when the gentrification was really taking off in New York City and a lot of other cities around the world, Lima was still really dangerous. That was the era of the Shining Path and a lot of crime and insecurity. So uh, even though know, downtown Lima was still never really all that gentrified. It was just beginning now. So uh, Kilka, which is uh, like the sort of uh, bohemian or alternative or hippie enclave, is like just right off of, um, of uh, Plaza San Martin, which is like one of the, the main squares right, right in downtown Lima. And there's lots of um, little funky bookstores and and murals on all of the walls. And these predate the official program of, of the mayor of Lima. These were sort of outlaw murals from, um, from back in the day, which just survived. This is uh, Fujimori, the former dictator of Peru from the 1990s, Loa La Dinastia Mafiosa, Loa to the Mafiosa dynasty, which is what they considered him to be with justice. Now, this is actually a larger photo. It seems to be being cut off. Is there some way to, to adjust that? Get the panoramic view? No, that's a shame. That's an important singer. Right, that's uh, Gilguero de Mascaran from, from Ancash, where you're from, right? He used to be a... Uh, he, he, he was a Congress person. Right, he was in Congress too, right? So he was a musician and a, yeah. and a politician. Yeah, one of the few. Politician of the left. Few. Right. That would have been when? In the, the 60s? Yeah. So this is, uh, I wish we had a larger view because it says, 14 años de contracultura, 14 years of counterculture. This is uh, the Kilka Community Center, 
with uh, the equivalent of, um, of Charas here on the Lower East Side. And unfortunately, like Charas, it's been evicted. And uh, just earlier this year, just before, just a couple of weeks before I was in Peru back in May, it had been evicted. So it's now, um, it's now vacant. It had been squatted. And uh, the landlord, because you know downtown Lima was considered kind of funky and dangerous, the landlord didn't do anything with the property. And um, just, uh, just recently, he decided to take it over again. So uh, now, unfortunately, um, the uh, El Aberno is what it's called. Do you, do you know what El Aberno means? Uh, like Inferno. Right, like, like, like hell or Inferno. Yeah, like so kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek name. But um, as in ABC No Rio, here on the Lower East Side, they did punk rock matinees, and uh, it was a lot of, um, of you know, sort of, uh, you know, punk rock culture, DIY culture going on. And uh, unfortunately now it's been evicted and it's sitting vacant. Wow. Really a shame. This is what it looked like uh, a year earlier when I was in Peru last time before it had been evicted, which is why you know, it doesn't say 14, 14 years of counterculture because that was kind of like their farewell message, I guess, as Esperanza, as Westra, hope is ours. Cultural, uh, cultural diversity and Bohemian, Bohemian tradition. So there's interesting sort of whimsical art, no matar, thou shalt not kill. And this is the Partido Extraterrestre, or la Revolución Universal, Peru, the extraterrestrial party for universal revolution. <laughs> That's the Buddha Ekeko, which is, uh, Ekeko was a uh, traditional uh, god, I think of the pre-Inca peoples, right? The, the Timonaco culture. Uh, right, it's kind of um, it's kind of like a symbol of good luck, kind of yeah, like yeah. a twenty. And so this is sort of <laughs> the Buddha. And instead of the lotus leaf in the Buddha's hand, it's coca leaf. Okay. <laughs> Here's the extraterrestrial party for universal revolution again, with the alien space alien with the Peruvian flag. Ah, now this is interesting. This is a, uh, a community center just, uh, just around the corner from El Aberno, which continues to exist. And the reason it continues to exist is, uh, this is really interesting. I couldn't quite figure out exactly how this worked. But um, again, back in the 1960s, there was a kind of a sort of a left-wing dictatorship in um, in, uh, in Peru under uh, General Jorge Velasco, who uh, inst instituted the agrarian reform. Velasco and... Alvarado? Yeah, Velasco Alvarado, yeah. So, um, and uh, he, he, took, he came to power in a coup d'etat. It wasn't exactly a democracy, but he did a lot of uh, progressive, forward thinking things. Yeah. And um, one of them was that uh, he took over some of the abandoned buildings which were uh, sitting and decaying in downtown Lima and turned them over to community groups. And uh, now what's what happening since then is uh, you know, he was deposed in a right-wing counter coup in, I believe, 1975, 1976, um, by Enrique Bermudez, who fortunately is now facing charges if they go to jail, it's along with Fujimori, who was also in jail, so these dictators are having to slowly but surely start to pay for their crimes. So um, then there was sort of after he was, after Velasco was, um, was ousted, there was sort of a period of right-wing backlash, but um, this, this building before it could be privatized was uh, sort of taken over by various community groups. It still continues to be taken over, uh, you know, squatted sort of on a, an informal basis by various community groups. But because it had been given to the people as a community center, the government hasn't evicted them. And the, the lead group which, uh, which is in control there are the, the Fonavistas. Fonavit was a sort of a... So it's kind of like a social security fund. Yeah, for um, uh, justice in terms of housing. Right. Mm -hmm. To help people get established in terms of housing. And then it was privatized, 
and there was a lot of corruption, and the money disappeared. So there's a lot of people who feel that they're owed money through this fund and uh, never got it, and they're angry, and uh, they call themselves the Bonavistas, and they are one of the principal groups which is squatting with this community. It's basically called Casa de Gobierno Directo del Pueblo, the, the house of direct government by the people. So they're demanding their right to actually manage this fund, which has been ostensibly created for them. And uh, similarly, there's, uh, but they're just one of the groups which are here. It's kind of a, um, it's kind of a, a mishmash of different groups. This is SUTEP, which is the, um, the, the education workers union, the teachers union. They've also got an office in there. And uh, these are the, uh, the, the so-called ethno cateristas who are kind of a mystical nationalist organization. President Ollanta Omala sort of came out of them. He was with one of their leaders. But, he, his, but his brother more so. But, but since he's been in power, he's sort of been playing that down. His brother is in prison now for having uh, fomented a, a coup d'etat. So um, they're kind of uh, populist, nationalist, but also with this real sort of exalted mystical sense of nationalism, which is a little bit creepy. But uh, they're, uh, they're in there as well. And, um, and I should say also that, uh, that the anarchists are in there. Uh, when I, I found the anarchist, I went to buy uh, the newspaper at a, um, at a newsstand, La Primera, which is kind of the, the left-wing daily. And the guy at the newsstand said, well, if you're interested in that, you might be interested in this one, Avan Zemos. And it turns out this is like the anarcho-syndicalist newspaper in, uh, in Lima. And uh, they've got a collective which has also got an office in the same building. And uh, interestingly, the followers of Velasco have also got their newspaper, El Diario. So um, it's all different ideologies who are, who are sharing this space. Well, ideologies just generally of uh, the left and populist sort of stance, and they all manage to get along with each other. You know, this was a, I wasn't here, unfortunately. These pictures were taken by my friend Eric after, after I already left, but this was a, um, the Feria de Papa, the, the, the potato festival, um, where, uh, this is actually uh, pan de quinoa, which is bread made from quinoa, which is a traditional Andean grain. Unfortunately, there's, um, been a tremendous, uh, you know, there's a big popularity of quinoa among health food fans here in here in the United States, which is really driving up the price of quinoa. So it's not really available to the to the campesinos in Peru so much anymore, which is unfortunate. But um, in addition to quinoa, um, Peru is the uh, birthplace of the potato. All potatoes on Earth trace their uh, their origin to varieties which originated in the Andes, originated in Peru. So there's a real push to try to preserve the the uh, indigenous varieties of potato, the land races, the, the original indigenous genetic strains of potatoes, which are beginning to disappear now, even though potatoes originated in Peru, but now, you know, they're buying GMO and transgenic potatoes from Monsanto and so on. The original potatoes are beginning to, to disappear. So there's sort of an effort by people who are conscious here. This is the, the white Andean potato, one of the original strains. Papaputis, Huevo de Indio. There is an Institute of the Potato. Yeah, it's funded by the World Bank, in fact. So they might have had something to do with, um, with this festival. All different colors, much more, much more uh, variety to how they look and how they taste and so on than you're used to with potatoes. Quinoa, different colors. You see, uh, usually um, 
difference. Mm -hmm. So why why don't match up that male there is a female? There is always this complementarity. For we're talking about quinoa or for many things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the Andean structure. Right. Yana means, Yana means black. Sorry to <coughs> offend the vegans. <laughs> Yana means black, yes. Right. And uh, corn, and this is uh, yeah. the special purple corn that they make a, um, a drink out of, chicha morada. Chicha. Chicha. Good for blood pressure, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, you know, this is traditional indigenous varieties that originated in Peru and now threatened by Global algorithms. You know, it's getting to the point where you can't get um, decent garlic in New York City anymore. Has anybody noticed that? Because yes. all the decent garlic has been forced off the market by this really, really bad GMO garlic from China. Well, fortunately, in Peru, you can still get good garlic. This is garlic uh, in the market in Lima, which was uh, grown, I believe, in Arequipa in the south of the country. Really good garlic with ginger. And well, this is coca leaf, which is also freely available in the um, freely available in the markets in, uh, throughout the country, and uh, widely used, more so up in the mountains than uh, than in Lima, but uh, used throughout the country, and uh, and legal for sale. Although it's, it's again, it's kind of a complicated situation. There's certain areas of the country where um, or certain communities in the country where it's legal to grow coca and others where it isn't, and, uh, and they send in troops to eradicate it. They don't actually spray glyphosate around the way they do in Colombia. Unfortunately, the Peruvians haven't gone for that, but they, they do, uh, you know, they burn the fields, they, and they try to eradicate it by, uh, by hand, with you know, national police as much as possible. Um, and of course, the United States is pressuring the Peruvian government to, you know, eliminate and make smaller the areas where it's grown legally, and to expand the areas where it's um, where it's uh, where it's illegal and it can be eradicated. It's also used for divination. For divination. divination. Yes, yes, yes. You uh, put it in your mouth and you ask some people. So if it's sweet, it's yes. If it's not sweet, it's not. Right. It's got all these mystical associations. <laughs> and it's also used you know, up in the mountains and high altitude. It's just used for the to get people through the day and get them to uh, you know be able to keep on working in the uh, in the very thin air and the high altitude way up in the mountains. What did you use it for, Bill? <laughs> you know, I, just, I, I couldn't. Uh, I tried to chew it once, so I just couldn't quite get into it. I like the tea. I like the coca tea. I couldn't quite get into the uh, into the mastication thing though. It's too much like having a a wad of you know lawn clippings in your mouth. But uh, in any event, uh, similarly, uh, when um, When Ollanta Obama took power, he appointed a very, a very forward-thinking sort of uh, dissident uh, by the name of uh, Ricardo Silverón as his drug czar, who called off the coca eradication. And then uh, Obama did his little tilt to the right and purged his cabinet, and uh, Silverón was sacked, and that was the end of that. And unfortunately, in those parts of the country, particularly this one area um, uh, called the Upper Wayaga Valley, and another area called the uh, the Upper Imac Na River Valley, or the Fry, where uh, there's actually remnant factions of the Shining Path, which are still around, and uh, they offer the coca growing peasants protection from the uh, from the government eradication teams, and uh, to, to try to win some support from the peasantry, and. Um, and uh, it's a very, very militarized situation. And uh, just when I was there, in fact, the police opened fire on a, um, on a what they call a combi, which is just like a uh, sort of a Volkswagen minivan used for public transportation in these communities out in the jungle. Uh, they just opened fire on a combi, and uh, seven people were injured. It's a miracle nobody was killed. So uh, there's a lot, still a lot of a lot of protest um, over uh, the illegal status of coca, and. The more enlightened people, even in the government, recognize that um, it's really a counterproductive policy to keep it illegal. And you know, there is traditional use. It isn't like it's all going for the cocaine mafias. And, um, and basically, the uh, the campesinos who are growing it, 
they, they don't have any they don't have any alternative because they, all these um, crop substitution programs well the uh, the crops that they're trying to substitute them for legal crops such as coffee or bananas or whatnot well um, the, all the, the prices for that are going down thanks to the very free trade economics which the government is is embracing which we'll talk about more later when we do our Skype hook up to um, to Lima. Now, now we're moving out of um, out of Peru, up into the uh, I'm sorry, out of Lima, up, in, up into the Campo, up into the countryside. People may have heard it was in the news today that they just did this um, this archaeological find of um, they found a uh, this amazing temple with all these preserved mummies from the Wari culture, which is a pre-Inca culture, many many hundreds of years old. And uh, this is the exact place, in fact, they call it the Castillo de Warme, which is the, or the, the castle of Warme. Warme is the name of the town in the uh, Ancash region, just up the coast from Lima. And uh, when I was there three years ago, um, it was completely unprotected, and it was just being just being looted, uh, unfortunately, by, um, by people just coming in and stealing things. It's really oops. so. It's a good thing that, in fact, they uh, they made this archaeological find here. Because when I was there. The uh, you know artifacts were literally just lying around on the ground for anybody to take, which is truly a crime. So maybe now they have found some very significant relics there. It's going to be whoops. It's going to be protected. You see, this is perhaps an entrance to a tomb. There was a uh, team of researchers from Poland in the excavation. It's lying right there on the ground, the skull of a uh, Wari king from hundreds of years ago. And this is uh, this is the market in uh, in Warme, which is a fishing village on the coast. And uh, this is pecare, the fish that they traditionally make um, ceviche out of. Exactly. So again, uh, sorry uh, all you vegans, but the ceviche is really really good. <laughs> okay, this is now uh, moving in from the coast, up into up towards the mountains. This is the uh, the Valle de Warme. This is one of the uh, the inter-Andean valleys, which the, the rivers that, that, that come down from the Andes. You go inland from here, and uh, it starts rising precipitously. And this is a uh, we saw chakra Cervantes before. This is a chakra Graal. This is a uh, cornfield which has just been harvested. And uh, this is a campesino community. And it's uh, very interesting. The name of this campesino community is ex hacienda and the reason for that is that it had been a um, it had been a hacienda it had been uh, somebody's big farm and when the peasants were working there they didn't own the land they were just working for the boss and uh, then in the um, in the agrarian reform in the 1960s the uh, it was broken up and um, and redistributed to the peasants so now they call it ex hacienda because it's no longer a hacienda and they grow, uh, mostly they grow maracoyo, maracoya, which is what we call passion fruit. Bill, so, yeah. uh, I grew up the same kind of geography as Ecuador with two cordilleras and a valley in between. There's three in Peru. Uh, yes. So this is in the foothills of the first one, the cordillera occidental. What are you talking about? What's that? I didn't get what you were discussing. Is it cordillera? Oh, Cordillera is, uh, just means a mountain range. So there's three principal ones in Peru, the Occidental, the Central, and the Oriental. So this is just coming in from the coast. So this would be in the foothills of the Cordillera Occidental. And this is Ex Hacienda, once again. And uh, this is just a political poster, but I just think it's such a, uh, you know, somebody wants to vote for the local, uh, the local uh, municipal committee in the local municipality of Wamba, but the name of the I think it's such an inspiring name that it's Ex Hacienda. <laughs> and people have actually taken back the land and now they're growing their own corn to feed themselves as opposed to um, <coughs> growing their own passion fruit, controlling their own destinies. Growing uh, avocado, banana, it's me on a mountain trail. Oh yeah. And I should point out I'm wearing the same shirt in this photo that I'm wearing today. Let me show off my uh, 
my uh, fashionable Peruvian brand <laughs> t-shirt. This is Jose Carlos Mariataguay, who was uh, the great Marxist theorist of Peru back in the 1930s. And the slogan says, uh, La revolución no es cauto ni copia, sino creación heroica. Revolution is not a carbon copy or a Xerox, but a heroic creation. And the point he was trying to make was um, that uh, it was really sort of the thesis he devoted his work to was uh, the notion that uh, we should look for models of socialism in the in the indigenous past in the Americas and um, to uh, you know self-governing, self-sufficient indigenous communities as a as a as a model for what uh, socialism could uh, could look like even even in the industrial age. And uh, this is beginning to come together in Peru. Now we're moving up uh, further up the coast. This is Cajamarca. People might be aware of what's been going on in Cajamarca. It hasn't got nearly enough coverage here, but uh, <clears throat> there's uh, a big, uh, very controversial mining project by the name of Conga, which, um, <clears throat> which is being... Uh, well, we got some feedback. That's in mind. Which, is, which is being developed by uh, Newmont Mining of Colorado. Um, on uh, areas where uh, where there's um, some uh, highland lakes, which uh, the campesinos uh, use and depend on for uh, for their water. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the the site we'll see a picture of this in a moment. The site that the uh, that Dumont wants to develop for the mine has actually been under occupation um, for um, for about a year. Uh, by local campesinos who say that they're going to put their bodies on the line to prevent the, the mineral project from going ahead. So um, this is actually, Bill, time's up in the room. Bill, you'd be interested in this. He left. He left. He's obsessed with plumbing. Well, this is, <laughs> this is plumbing that dates all the way back to uh, the time of the Incas or even before. The amazing thing about this is the city of Calamarca, right outside of the city of Calamarca. This is a national park which is a protected area. One of the reasons it's protected is that um, it's actually got these, uh, these irrigation canals, um, which, were, which were used in pre-Inca times, and are actually still <clears throat> feeding the municipal water supply of the city of Calamarca today. So uh, a part of the, um, of the municipal water supply for the city of Calamarca is actually still fed by these, uh, by these irrigation canals, which date all the way back to actually from before the Incas, from something like the probably 500 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> you see the water coming down to the mountains? These are petroglyphs right over the irrigation canal. It's chewing right out of the rock. And here's where it begins to meet more recent channeling, which delivers it to the city water supply. And this is the city. This is a colonial church in the city of Calamarca. And Marcha Nacional por el Agua. This was in uh, February of last year, February of 2012. The, um, the campesinos actually marched something, how many miles, 500 miles or something, from, uh, from Cajamarca to Lima to protest this mining project. Aerial view of the city of Cajamarca. And uh, it's interesting, the, uh, the project, the Conga mining project, is actually, it's an extension of, a, uh, of the Anacocha mining project, which, already, which has already been under development for the past 20 years or so. And um, it's already, um, have taken an impact on the region's waters. So the city of Cajamarca gets its, um, gets its water on the, on the west side from those irrigation canals that I just showed you from the protected area right outside town. And on the east side, deeper into the mountains, it gets the water from the area where the mine now is. And that water, for the past 20 years that the mine has been in operation, that water has been disappearing. So the people on the west side of the city, they still don't have water. People on the east side of the city, they only have like uh, two or three hours of water a day now, whereas they had had you know, water 24-7 just 10, 15 years ago. And the population is 
100%, almost, I would say, 100%, so I put a few, a few communities up in the mountains where, where the residents all work at the mine, almost everybody is opposed to uh, the Concord Project. But up here on the hill overlooking town, in addition to the insignia of all the sports teams, it says no walk on yet. No to the Congo Project. And uh, there's uh, protests and demonstrations against the project almost constantly in the city of Cajamarca. And uh, Cajamarca has got extremely historically significant. Back in, um, in uh, 1532, it was where um, uh, Pizarro took captive Atahualpa, the um, the king of the, uh, the Inca Empire, and held him uh, hostage in this room, uh, which was in order to ransom him. Uh, Atahualpa had the room filled entirely up to up to his head with uh, gold and silver that was brought from all over the empire, and then Pizarro went ahead and killed him anyway. So, Sala Principal de la Casa del Cacique de las Setas, Guardan, Guarangas de Camarca, y es la misma que según como tradicional, como tradición, la presión a Matahualpa y no de un retrato por su rescate. The uh, principal room of the house of the chieftain of the seven districts of Camarca, which is the same which according to common tradition, uh, Matahualpa offered to fill with um, uh, gold and silver for his rescue. And there's still fighting over gold and silver in the region today. Only instead of Pizarro and the Espanoles, it's Newmont Mining of Colorado and other mineral companies. Accompanied by the uh, National Police, you can see there, riot police almost constantly on patrol. This is uh, more um, pre Inca rooms right outside town. And this is, uh, this is the site of the project. This is Conga. This is one of the beautiful, pristine alpine lakes, which uh, Newmont Mining wants to turn into a, into a giant open pit mine. And the idea is that they, the company is saying, oh, don't worry, we'll save your lakes. We're going to relocate them. <laughs> they're actually, they're going to, uh, they're, they're going to like, build reservoirs and, uh, and pump the water out to these reservoirs while they turn the the original lakes into, um, into big open pit mines. And the campesinos are not going for that. So this was a, um, a big demonstration, which was, uh, which was held there. This would have been World Water Day, which was March 22nd of last year when I was there. And fortunately, it was all tranquilo. The police didn't open fire on the protest when I was there, thank goodness. They have done that a few times. And over the past few years of protest, numerous people have been killed. In, um, in this region. This is just outside of the, uh, the, uh, the area which is slated for mining, but it's what the whole landscape looks like. This is what they call the Puna, which is the, the Alpine Plain, which is just tied up with lakes. And here you can see the, this is already, this is the, the, the line of the, the road leading into the the area which is under mineral development, you can see the mineral exploitation encroaching onto the landscape here. Again, sorry to offend the vegans, one of the things that the campesinos use the lakes for is for um, aquaculture. This is trout. In a uh, feeding the trout that we eat for dinner, really, really good trout. Um, in one of the uh, local communities near the bond site. And uh, then after dinner, a uh, big community meeting was held to um, oppose the mining project. Passing around coca leaf to ward off the cold. And this is the Anacocha mine, which they now want to expand into the Conga area. This is once again the, uh, the big protest that was held in the, in the concession area. El agua es un tesoro que vale más que oro. Agua sí, oro no. Water is a treasure that's worth more than gold. Water, yes. Gold, no. Both of kids are involved. And uh, this is interesting. This is uh, at the beginning of the protest. They're all singing the Peruvian national anthem. And you can see they've got the Peruvian flag over here. 
but they've also got another flag. This is a variation of the Wifala, which is the uh, uh, the sort of rainbow flag of the uh, indigenous peoples of the Andes. So this sort of uh, the more traditional Peruvian nationalism, and then there's the uh, the more uh, uh, sort of uh, indigenous ethnic nationalism, and they exist side by side in the movement with a certain degree of tension. No más minería en Capacero de Cuenca, no more mining in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the watershed. Ollanta, prisionera, Ollanta, being President Ollanta Humala, is uh, treasonous. And uh, it's interesting, uh, the movement uh, is, is really it's being organized by what they call the Rondas Campesinas, which are the, the, um, the peasant self-defense patrols, uh, which got started back in the, in the 70s and the 1980s, um, where there was a lot of, a lot of lawlessness in the region, uh, due not only to uh, Sendero Luminoso, but also just due to Sendero Luminoso didn't really have a bunch of a stronghold up here in Cajamarca. So up here in Cajamarca had more to do with cattle rustling and just banditry. And in these uh, very remote communities, there really isn't any presence of, of the government, of the state, until the Indians start protesting, of course. So uh, they formed what they call the Rondas Campesinas, which are the peasant self-defense patrols. And, um, that, and so that's really the primary sort of self-organization of the Campesino communities up in the mountains. And now they're the ones who are organizing the protest. Every village will send uh, the, the patrols, will organize everybody who wants to participate and put together a, a delegation or an affinity group for the big regional mobilizations such as this one where, they, where they're occupying the, the site, the concession site for the mineral project. So if these are all, each, each Ronda will have uh, you know, its own banner representing its own village. And there they are marching down to one of the lakes which the mining company wants to destroy. Not exactly in chronological order, sorry. Seeing the national anthem again. It's the Peruvian flag and the indigenous flag. This is Quechua. Can you read this, Miriam? This is Quechua. Can you, can you read this? playing his fiddle on top of a rock by the waterside. Because when you have your musical instruments, you should put them all night near the lagoon or near um, falls, so that the spirits will, uh, you know, bless them. And then you go the next day, you know, the is... The market in Camarca. And uh, finally, now we're moving into, uh, moving into the jungle, into the rainforest. This is uh, Puerto Maldonado, where they're uh, loading papaya onto a boat and bananas. You take it down the, uh, the, the river, which is a tributary of the Amazon. And this was uh, the, uh, the first big uprising of 1999 was uh, in, in, in the Amazon rainforest, I'm uh, sorry, 2009, was uh, in the Amazon rainforest. That was the year that the, uh, the free trade agreement took, um, took effect with the United States, the, the Peruvian free trade agreement. Um, and it's very, uh, it's almost a perfect analogy to what happened in, um, in Mexico in uh, 1994. People remember in 1994, Mexico entered NAFTA, and uh, one of the provisions of NAFTA, which was sort of pushed through by the Mexican Congress in preparation for the free trade agreement was uh, they made it easier for um, uh, indigenous and communal lands 
uh, to be to be privatized and to be uh, and to be sold off to agribusiness and mineral interests or whatever. And this is this was the, the primary grievance which led to the emergence of the Zapatista movement in Chiapas. Well, the same thing happened in Peru. Virtually, the uh, one of the provisions that was passed through the Peruvian Congress for the free trade agreement was. Um, for the uh, lands which had been entitled to indigenous communities could, be, uh, could make it more easy for them to be, to be privatized. And uh, the indigenous actually had an uprising in, uh, in the Amazon rainforest in, um, in uh, that year in 2009. In, uh, very interestingly, on I believe it was June 6th, which is um, just two days after the, uh, t the, the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre in, uh, in Beijing in 1989, um, almost exactly 20 years after, June 6, uh, uh, 2009, in Peru was what they called the, the, uh, the uh, Amazon's Tiananmen Square Massacre, where at a place called Bagua, the uh, indigenous were blocking the roads, and they, what they've been doing all over the Amazon, blocking the roads, taking over the oil installations, taking over the hydro dams, and so on. They were blocking the road, just similarly, this happens to be in Machu de Dios, the same situation. These are... Um, uh, Ashanika people, I believe. Um, and the national police opened fire on them, and uh, something like uh, 30 people were killed. Uh, right, that in uh, uh, people, yeah. But this is Harukbat um, and the Ashanika people in, um, in Marte Dios, which is in the southern part of the Amazon, as opposed to Bagua, which is up in the northern part of the Amazon. So this again was a part of that same uprising in um, 2009. Peace and justice over our ancestral rights. So they're kicking it real, so to speak, putting on war paint and marching with spears and bows and arrows to demonstrate that they are serious about defending their land. And the kids are involved too. And there we are back to the end. So uh, it's interesting, it's sort of part two of this saga, perhaps just about to open now because there's a, uh, a new free trade agreement called the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP, which is uh, moving ahead, um, which would further open up Peru to um, to agribusiness and uh, mineral and oil interest and so on. And it would actually be, uh, uh, just as uh, NAFTA was conceived as sort of a, as a regional uh, or continental um, free trade agreement for all of North America, the, uh, the TPP is conceived as the same sort of thing for all the Pacific Rim nations. And uh, last month, there was a round of negotiations for the TPP in Lima, and there were, um, there were uh, protests, as you might imagine. So are we going to try to establish our uh, 